Welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Kabert, and this year marks the fifth birthday of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I started this pod back in 2019 when I was taking my first steps on the path of remembering. And at the time, the tagline for the show was a journey of self discovery. A year later, it became a journey of remembering. Yet, what I know now is back then I was still seeking. And what I've come to know now is that it's the journey of seeking that brings us the silent, slow stillness of acceptance. And therein lies our own innate wisdom. It's my mission now to eradicate the glorification of hustle culture, as it was my drive in entrepreneurship that led to a greater whole. And that's because I was outsourcing my sovereignty rather than looking within. So let this be your invitation to take a deep breath in and remember that at any time we can shift our thoughts and our feelings to create the outer world in which we wish to live. Soul Seekers, it's time to grow. Let's go. Here we are back again for a third time with my good homie, Melanie Joy. She also goes by MJ, Mel, and May May, and so many other names, but we will think of her as the good old MJ. Melanie Joy, all right. So before we jump in, I've been liking to really settle in with some breath. So if you're listening to this podcast and you're driving or doing anything where you can't close your eyes, I invite you to breathe with us. Just keep your eyes open. But for anyone else, if you find yourself kind of walking around the house, just start to settle down and find a seat or you could hit pause till you can and come back. And for Melanie and I, we'll start to close our eyes, just landing and feeling your feet on the floor. And through the nose, finding a big inhale all the way up. Sipping in a bit more at the top. Hold the breath. And through the mouth, audible sigh, let it go. Another inhale through the nose, inhaling all the way up. Sipping in a bit more at the top, holding the breath, rolling back the eyes as if you're looking at the third eye, and just holding the breath. Through the mouth, exhale, let it go. And last one, biggest one yet. Inhaling all the way up. Sipping in a bit more air. Sipping a bit more. Hold the breath. Roll back the eyes. Maybe apply root lock. And exhaling, letting it go. Letting the breath return to its natural state and rhythm and flickering the eyes open. And here we are, Melanie Joy. In one word, how are you feeling in this moment right now? Oh, I'm so excited to talk to you, Sam. It's been such a long time. We looked at our podcasts earlier and realized it's every two years we do a podcast. So it feels special. It feels like we're right on time. And um, I'm excited. So I'll take that paragraph and, and say the summary is excited. In yeah. one word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it, it's so funny because you were on the pod. I was thinking about this earlier. It was like podcast number 28 or something. And it's linked in the show notes so you guys can check it out. That was in 2020. It was less than a year being into this podcast. And it was probably right around the time or before the lockdowns. I forget the date. Either way, it was like right around that time. So I think you're one of the last people that I interviewed in person before I opened it up to being remote because my initial rule with the Soul Seeker podcast was it had to be in person. It had to be outdoors. You remember that? Now I remember. Yeah. Our first podcast was in 2020, right after Tulum. Yeah. And then our second podcast was uh, in whenever it was 2022, post COVID at your house. So now I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. So here we are two years later, totally not planned. And it's funny because you and I, we haven't really kept in touch much in the past year, but over the years, we've had very parallel and similar journeys. And I think 
part of the reason why we didn't keep in touch over the past years because both of our lives imploded and a lot of people's lives imploded. And I think that's a good place to start. I, I know right now you're, you recently left trauma work. I don't know all the details. We chatted about it a little bit, but I'd love to hear from you. Like, why did you leave trauma work and just expand on that? Yeah, so I am a somatic release breathwork a facilitator, a sound healer. I was working in the last probably five years now in psychosomatic and spiritual development for women, um, crossing thresholds of maturity. What does it mean to cultivate feminine, conscious femininity in our lives? Really working with women in uh, unpacking their stories. And um, recently, as you mentioned, over the last year, uh, pretty much in, I don't know, September of 2023, my whole life dissolved, like material world. Um, I was living in Sedona at the time. I lost my house. I had the most expansive year of my life. So that's kind of a good preface it to say, you know, I had a women's retreat to Peru, taking people out on the river, whitewater rafting, you know, it was just this epic year, the most growth in my business. And then I came back and everything dissolved. My business, my house, my car, everything just kind of took a plummet and it spiraled me out of Sedona and into Phoenix. What felt like at the time was Benounce my will, you know, like that's not what I have, what I would have chosen for my life. And I went into this real deep, portal of grief. And, um, you know, another back note is my daughter's 22. So there's this been this big threshold of coming out of motherhood, coming out of an identity for the last say, five years. Um, anyways, I reached this real deep portal of grief when I landed in Phoenix. And then through that portal went on a real deep cellular cleanse of my body from parasites to heavy metal toxins to my liver, gallbladder, kidneys, changed my diet. I mean, just really went on this real deep material cleanse of my actual body. And through that, coming out of that portal, I felt so changed. I felt like I had seen aspects of my own victim consciousness that I didn't know were driving the threads of my psyche. And I realized I was a match for this trauma work with women because I was still heavy, heavily operating in my own trauma, right? Like attract likes, um, that whole story of like perpetuating the things in our lives and not really knowing. So just to answer yourself, your question, I think, simply was that I got out of trauma work because I was no longer a match for my own trauma, which so was actually the most alleviating, freeing thing I could ever realize in my life, moving past my own stories. I definitely want to unpack all this more, but just it specifically like getting that realization of like, oh, I'm no longer an energetic match and I can't do this uh, anymore. Like, what did that actually look like for you? Well, I'll tell you what it, it looked, it looked pretty traumatic, right? Like I had just signed a couple clients at a, at a pretty good marginal rate um, for more maiden work is what we call it in my work. So I had some younger women come to me. They wanted to work through what I had been working through with women over the last five years. And first of all, when your life is metaphorically on fire, you don't build when your whole life is on fire because that too will catch fire. And so I accepted these clients going against my own intuition that I'm not really in a space to hold space for other people right now. I'm holding space for myself. And it's taking everything that I have to hold space for myself. So because of the money, I accepted the clients. And you know what happened from there? It didn't go well. I was no longer an energetic match for the maiden work. And everything in my body was saying, don't teach this material anymore. Because, you know, if you're teaching material that you have moved past or that your body wants to transform through to your own next level of consciousness, if you continue telling your story through, through the work to other people, 
you are reinforcing what your body is trying to transform through. And so my body was like, hard no. And then guess what helped? What happened there? It didn't go well. My business dissolved even more, <laughs> right? Like I had to give myself space for the own transformation process that was happening within me. And I couldn't do that if I was still teaching women the work that I was trying to transform through. How much are you open to sharing about like, like just how low it got? Well, we've been here before, Sam. I think we've been pretty vulnerable <laughs> on our other True. podcast. So um, yeah, it got, it got pretty, it got pretty scary, this deep portal of grief. I was homeless. I had zero money in my bank account. I remember at one point I was staying at a girlfriend's house and just absolutely falling to my knees and screaming, please don't take anything else from me. You know, at, at that point, everything was dissolved and then a, one of my dogs died. So it was kind of like, wow, the only thing I actually have left is my daughter. And God forbid that get taken as well. It was this conversation with the universe of like, I can't take any more. Please make it stop. And I was looking for facilities to check into, mm. you know, I had a girlfriend in Michigan Googling places in Arizona, facilities that I could take, that I could check into for mental health break, for a mental health check. You know, I suffered with suicidal ideations for a majority of what I would call the first act of my life. And even in this portal of grief, even though I had worked through, I no longer resonate with those suicidal ideations, I was still watching them come up in the moment. And watching old patterns come up in the moment as the observer and being like, wow, I'm here again. Those thoughts are coming up again. No engagement with the thoughts, but seeing them come up again was scary enough. And I didn't know what to do. And so the beautiful thing is a girlfriend let me stay at her house. When I had no food, somebody donated to get me food. When I had no yoga, this beautiful yoga instructor wanted to donate to my yoga fund. When I was looking for facilities for three days, I had girlfriends on girlfriends on girlfriends, community. I had community on the phone with me. And what I really saw at the well of nothing was how supported I was by people. And I think that that was the lesson that I needed to see as this hyper-independent woman that thinks she can do everything on her own, I didn't need a facility. I needed community. And I needed to see that I had that. Can you repeat that last sentence again? I didn't need a facility. I needed community. And I needed to see that I had that. That's beautiful right there. Is that something you've said uh, quite a few times at this point? It was a big realization in yeah. that moment and when these realizations really hit your body and land in your som somatic experience not as a mental understanding but like as something that the transformation cells can like breathe into you know mm -hmm. my cells were breathing into this lesson that became this somatic experience of how supported i actually am because not I not Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Not to get off track here, because I want to stay on this thread, but uh, you and I were recently talking about your books, and we'll go down a little bit of a rabbit hole at uh, your book and your blogs and all that. I, the reason why I asked you to repeat that, I'm like, that is just like something profound that you could unpack in a blog and a book or anything. So what's what's currently going on with your book and your writing and everything? It's a great segue because at the bottom of nothing, the only thing I had left was my writing and my book. And I will use that as the only thing that I had left, even in this portal of grief, or most especially in the portal of grief, was creation. Grief wants an outlet. Grief is a very strong, you can channel this grief ener energy into creation and we see this all the time with the monets and the van goghs and you know your, your depeche mode right like your music right like taylor swift for crying out loud every time she's in a deep portal of grief with a man what does she do write another album she channels it right and so 
I started painting again. I wrote my book. You know, I launched my blog. But, but the other thing I want to mention is my book has been in my body for 10 years. And it's always been this thing of like, here's the other thing about creation. Creation wants to be released. And so there's no point in creating without releasing it from your child. It's just like birth. What happens if you don't go into labor? Well, you die, right? Like the baby dies, your creation dies, the mother will die, you get a stillbirth. Like, might sound dramatic, but this is exactly what's happening with the creation energy within you. It wants to be first gestated and then birthed. And so, so yeah, in lieu of a, you know, my story with my, with my publisher, you know, it's been a long journey down the publishing road of losing a lot of money, hiring someone else, losing more money, hiring someone else, losing more money, hiring someone else. And then you realize I've just got to do it myself in whatever means necessary. And so my book is currently being released on my blog and it feels so good to get this stuck creative energy out of my body. So, so unpack that a little bit more. Your book is currently being released on your blog. Like what's the strategy of that? What, what does that look like? So I'm a storyteller. So every chapter of my book is a short story in itself. And so I'm taking all of these short stories like a Clarissa Pinkles Estes would, right? And, or a Maureen Murdoch or a Marion Woodman and releasing chapters, short stories of my book on the blog. That's awesome. And so yeah, I... you can subscribe to my subscriber list and uh, see what comes out on a weekly basis. I just released one, actually, this is funny, on Tulum, oh, where our wow. first podcast was. And it's all about internal family systems, IFS, and releasing uh, our coping mechanism. So releasing the need to cope at all because we've come to a place of reconciliation and, and essentially healing. So when you say releasing our need to, or releasing our coping mechanisms, could you unpack that a little bit more? Just give us like a little high level of what that blog entails. Sure. I can tell you a little bit about the story. When you and I, Sam, went to Tulum in 2020 for our first Fit for Service event mm -hmm. with uh, Aubrey Marcus's uh, crew, I had an intention to strengthen my ability to cope. And the story on the blog will tell you about an experience I had through the Temescal or the sweat lodge where I met my inner child. And the moral of the story is I wasn't there to strengthen my capability to cope. If coping is actually ways to deal instead of heal, mm. right? So coping mechanisms are put into place because something traumatic happened and it's our way of dealing with the trauma. But what if we didn't need the coping mechanisms anymore because the trauma has been reconciled and released from the body? So you no longer need to deal because you actually healed. And I realized my intention was not about strengthening my capacity to cope. It was actually releasing the need to cope at all. I love that so much. You know, that's not something I've put a lot of thought into and it's not like a specialty of mine or anything but there has been a few times in the past year probably the past year or so where i've heard people talk about coping mechanisms and i was really fascinated and thrown off being like well y'all be talking about this like it's a good thing shouldn't you not use that but i never put much more uh, thought into that and the similar thing came up last year with compartmentalization and our good uh, homie, Alicia Kay, who just released her podcast, Alive and Awake, which is a phenomenal brand new podcast. And she's a IFS and traumatic uh, therapist. She, uh, I did a podcast with her last year about compartmentalization because I was like, Alicia, we got to talk about this like on a podcast because this is like a good topic. And I think a, a lot of people could uh, benefit from this because in my view, I've thought like compartmentalization is terrible because it, you're just putting things in a box and you never go back and revisit it. So we had a really good, healthy conversation where she was talking about 
all the positive sides of compartmentalization and how it helps you perform in the moment. I was like, well, yeah, 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 that's true. But at the end of the day, most people don't actually open up that box and that's the problem. And I feel like this is a very similar thing with compartmentalization and coping mechanisms, you know? Absolutely. Um, so compartmentalization equals fragmentation. Mm. And when we want to embody our fullest expression, fragmentation has no business there. We have to pull all those compartmentalized pieces, which are a part of our fullest expression from the happiness, the sadness, the joy, the anxiety, the fear, the safety, all forms of expression. Fullest expe expression is every emotion on the spectrum that we have the capability to feel. And anything that the body is able to feel is intelligent, right? And so back to coping mechanisms, bless them. My coping mechanisms helped me get through the first act of my life, right? It's the best tools that I had on my tool belt were the coping mechanisms that I had built. But my consciousness wanted to evolve from there. So if we are still in our coping mechanisms that we picked up from when we were five and seven and nine and 11 or the angry teenager or the 20 year old that was in its perpetual doing to, you know, strive for success in the patriarchal power over dominant way the, oper the world operates today. And now all of a sudden we want to come into more of our yin energy, for example, which has been a journey for you, right? Mm -hmm. We can't reject any part of us. We have to decompartmentalize or defragmentize. We have to pull all pieces back in. And we have to recognize all those pieces, even the sticky ones, are a part of our journey, are a part of the fullest expression of who we are, are a part of how we operate. So there's, just, so there's no naysaying. To our coping mechanisms, good job. They worked for a certain period of our life. Pat yourself on the back. You developed tools that helped you, right? And now all of a sudden you're into breath work and you understand that the tools that you used to operate were are no longer working for you. You keep losing the job. You keep having the same archetype of a toxic boss. You keep having the same archetype of a toxic relationship. You keep struggling with the adversarial thinking that's happening within yourself, your own patterning, right? Seeing all of these patterns is your opportunity to recognize that your coping me mechanisms aren't working anymore and they're actually asking for you to transform beyond them and pick up the Ooh. tools. I, I love that right there. The part about seeing them and it's an opportunity and it's, it's a setup for what's next. So thank you for sharing that. And one final question on this uh, topic. with your releasing of your coping mechanisms, has there been a specific tools or multiple modalities that you've picked up that have helped you to release them? Maybe it was breath work, maybe it was a combination of things, but what, what exactly helped you most? It was a combination of things. I think it was just, well, you and I know we've, do, we've dove heavily into the plant medicine world, though a lot of plant medicine, that's one thing. I'm not, I'm not saying that that's, all positive. I'm saying that that was an evolution of my journey that also needed to evolve, right? Um, painting, breath work, sound healing, vibrational medicine, the breath, all those tools helped a lot. But one tool that I really want to stress that I just experienced the beginning of this year was cleansing my body from parasitic thinking, cleansing my body from heavy metals, toxins parasite, my liver, the mucoid plaque within my intestinal tract, right? I mean, just a deep cellular cleanse of things that carry consciousness in my body that is standing in between me and my own authentic consciousness, right? Parasites have a consciousness, heavy metal and toxins are weighing your body down. The issues in our tissues, we say it all the time, right? The issues are in your tissues. There's cellular memory within this. So one of the most expansive things that I've recently experienced is cleaning the body at a cellular level to release those issues in my tissues, to release 
parasitic consciousness that's affecting my own authentic nature. So um, that's one thing I would really love to stress, this deep cleansing process and doing it professionally, um, having a guide. I did mine through an iridology exam, I-R-I-D-O-L-O-G-Y, iridology, on the premise of regenerative health, which means removing, you know, everything from the body. We're always trying to take more vitamins. We're always trying to eat more food, maybe more of the right food. You think it's the right food, right? Um, regenerative health actually excavates everything from the body because we're completely saturated. From the time that we were born, there's just all these things coming in, 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 in the system. Same theory with breath work. The, the opportunity here is to express things out of this system, but even with plant medicine, purge things out of the system, right? So regenerative health, clean the cellular level so it gets back to its homeostasis. So it starts regenerating instead of just malabsorption, basically. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, let's let's unpack all of this um, and linking this back into your story of like when life imploded and rock bottom and you had all your sisters and friends that were there to support you and hold you. Uh, at what point did the detox and the cleanse start to come into your awareness? Well, I got to Phoenix and somehow I started working at a restaurant again. It was a hole in the wall, little diner kind of restaurant. And my God, I've had 12 years in corporate and I've been coaching women for years and I've raised a kid. And how could I end up shining silverware and wiping tables again, you know? And uh, that's when this cleanse came into my field. And it's funny because I went into a four-day water fast before I started the cleanse just to kind of kick it off. And the day that I started the water fast is the same day that I removed a partner from my life that actually wasn't working, that I got fired from the restaurant that was actually not for me. I actually got to see things in my material world that needed to be cleansed as I was going into this deep cellular cleanse. You think of like, as within, so without, right? And so, you know, there can be, this is what I don't think people relate. This is what I don't think people understand. When you are losing things in life or excavating things in life or excavating things from your body, shit's going down. And we start to grasp onto old stories and old paradigms and things that we think are making us safe. But the opportunity is actually to let it all go. To create space. Physical energetic in the subtle body system, material world, right? Like we have to let things go and trust. It's because space is being made for the divine opportunity of miracle to pour in. How did that unfold for you? Because at the same time, you mentioned a lot of victim and uh, consciousness and victim mentality, right? So it's a huge, it's a huge thing because it's so easy. And I, I struggle with that myself. I'm not saying like I'm, I'm better at that. In fact, I think that's something I'm being called for myself to really be honest in what areas that I have a victim mentality. Because in the past few years, I've asked some of my closest friends like, do I have a victim mentality? Because I kind of feel like I do. And they're like, no, not at all. I'm like, no, I kind of feel like I do though, you know? Um, so if you're really being asked to be stripped of everything and just truly surrender, but at the same time, you're kind of stuck in like, woe is me. How, what does that actually look like to get over the hump? Woe is me is the polar opposite of gratitude. And when you have nothing, you are grateful for everything and anything, right? I didn't have a home. I was so grateful my girlfriend let me stay in hers. I didn't have any 
food. I was so grateful to work at this restaurant to have food to eat. Right. So, so just to interject or just to jump in here, when you're shining silver and waiting tables and think like, man, I got out of corporate America to do my thing. I have my book coming out. I'm going to be speaking on stages. I'm leading women in online courses, taking them to Peru and doing a river rafting trip and doing so many amaz amazing things. And here I am shining silverware and waiting tables. Y you're, you turn that to, I'm grateful because I get a meal here because I'm working here. And that helps you to overcome that, right? So uh, Buddha says, enlightenment is nothing but a perspective shift. And so I could have been at that restaurant like, woe is me. Instead, I was wiping tables at the end of the night, having conversations with God. Mm. Because I was so open to receive those conversations with God at the bottom of nothing. After I took off my mask of existence, after I took off everything that I thought I was, but I thought I was a coach, but I thought I was a woman, you know, but I thought I was this uber successful person that was actually built in ego. And there was a huge ego death that was occurring. And so I realized you... once again, for the umpteenth time, that I am not any of those things. And at the same time, I am everything. Mm -hmm. Powerful. Yeah, there's, there's something that's coming through. I uh, just to uh, stay on this for a moment here. Last year, for me, my entire life implode, right? So like, it was kind of to your experience there. It was like, I have no choice. And this year I've been looking at it and be like, why is this year harder than last year when on the surface, like things are pretty good. And what my theory is like, when everything is like being stripped away and when you need to be at that point of surrender, it's almost easier. But when it's not directly in your face and you can't necessarily name it, and it's just, it's a little bit harder. Cause I think a lot of people listening might resonate with like, yeah, maybe not everything's going wrong. So I don't need to fully surrender, but there's, there's just some things that are off. Like, do you feel that way too, that it's almost harder to surrender when it's not just so in your face? Well, it's harder to surrender when you're still grasping for life, when you're still holding on. Right. I think right. it's important to talk about the adversary voice mm -hmm. and how to identify our victim mentality through the thoughts that are occurring in our own head, through the adversary voice. The adversary voice sounds just like you, except it's not feeding you life. It's not life giving. It's dead energy. It's keeping you small. And so you know, it's the shadow of the child, right? It's the shadow of the prostitute archetype. It's the shadow of the victim, the shadow of the saboteur, you know? And so to also understand that you took on this narrative somewhere in your life, probably when you were experiencing something traumatic that your parents said or worse, right? And so it sounds just like you, but there's one key aspect it isn't you because you, my friend, are creative energy and creative energy only feeds life. And so when your friend is telling you, no, man, you're not a victim. The moment that you fall suit to, yeah, I'm not a victim is the moment that you can no longer see your adversary because you're in denial of it. For you to say, I don't know, I really feel like this might be true is actually a door into the opportunity to see how you've been playing the game with your own adversary, how you've been struck in the drama loop of your own persecutor, your own victim, and your own rescuer. And what if the only way to win the game of the drama loop within your own psyche, within your own adversary is to not play the game? Stop being your own victim who then needs rescued, who then prosecutes you for being a victim, who then needs rescued again, who then prosecute. This is the sound of your adversary voice. And this is the sound that is anti-life that prevents you from gratitude. You are go. alive and you are breathing and you are creative life force energy. You are the creation itself. Right? Like, if it's not feeding you life, it's a lie. 
our cells are constantly dying into ourselves and at every second of every moment of every day, every seven years, we get a brand new body. We are regenerating ourselves at every moment. Just to bring in the fact that like you, sir, are the creation. So whatever you're creating in your material world that's making you feel like a success or that you're meriting is your success, that is outside of you for success, right? Like you already are success. You're freaking breathing and regenerating yourself at every moment of every day. You already are the creation. Whatever you're creating on top of that is extra. Good for you. Uh, I just want to highlight one thing you said. If it's not feeding you life, it's a lie. Yes. Uh, that is something that if you are resonating with this conversation right now and you're really feeling this, I would encourage you to write that down. If if it's not feeding you life, it's a lie. In fact, I'm even going to add that in my notes. And another one, I, you're so good with these, Melanie. You always have been with like these these sayings, you know? And there's another one I heard recently that I, I love. It's my frequency is what I frequent. My frequency is what I frequently see. And that's another one that I really like a lot. Um, so to transition to the adversary. I want to I want to talk on that because all, it's exactly right. We always find what we're looking for. So if your adversary and your own internal programming, your own internal narrative that's not feeding you life is looking to like the ego has two jobs to uh, be right and for you not to die. And so your adversary built in this ego is looking to be right. So your adversary says, Sam, you're not doing a good job. So now you're looking for everywhere that you're not doing a good job and you will find exactly what you were looking for every time. So my question is, what are you looking for? Start looking for that. I, I know for me, I'm just starting to come out of a month long depression as of like three days ago. And what I'm saying and everything that I'm personally sharing is like, I had so much, ex this is being recorded the end of June, but of 2024 and 2000, just a month previous, uh, May, I had so much expansion, right? My sixth book, first Ted talk, first paid keynote men's group in Costa Rica. There's, I turned 36 and not that matters, but like that kind of does round up to 40. Right. And a lot of things in my life are still just in crumbles from last year, even though it's not like as bad. I've worked through it emotionally, but like on a 3D level, right? Um, and then to some of the things you st said earlier, because you know me personally, you know, kind of ex seeking external validation and in the, the, okay, I put out my art, you know, and I didn't put this out for specific other for a specific reason other than it was being asked to be birthed, right? Um, I think the only thing I might say was a little ego driven was the TED talk and like part of the career, but the book, you know, that was totally just birthed. I had no plans on that. So there's a contraction period, right? But then there's also the ego and the adversarial voice getting in being like, oh, but this isn't equating to dollars. It doesn't have the views or, you know, the rankings, whatever the things are. So it's so easy to go in that downward spiral when I'm already in a contraction period and with seasonal effectiveness disorder and not to identify with that. I've been doing a lot better with that, but fact of the matter is here in Santa Cruz in June, it doesn't burn off sometimes till the fog till like 5 p.m. So and it can be really hard to energetically get going, but my sanctuary personally has been surfing. And one of the things that I want to talk with you if we have time later, or maybe right now, is breath work because we're both uh, breath work practitioners. We're trained in the same style. And I know for me right now, it's like I have zero interest in breath work. You know, I'll, I'll try breath work. Uh, I've tried it a few times in the past month. And it's just like, it's a big no right now, even though that I know this works for me. Every time I'm in a period of needing to readjust, recalibrate, it's like, oh, oh, I know what works for me because I've been experimenting with these different tools. And then every time I'm in this period of realignment, it's like, okay, what worked previously isn't necessarily going to work right now. So I'm open to uh, playing with that. So all of that there, before we move on, I'll, I'll give you a chance to 
respond or whatever? One thing that I'm noticing, like I said, I gave my business up and I gave everything that I love up. It was like, okay, at the bottom of nothingness, I have nothing. I, everything that I love, I needed to give up. And what I hear is that you love breath work or at a point in your time, you love, at a, at a point in time, you love breath work. At a point in time, I'm sure there's, oper- there's moments because I know how much you love the ocean, but I'm sure that there's moments in time where you didn't even want to go down to the ocean. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? And so sometimes the things that we love need to be let go in order for them to come back to us with us in a whole new energy. Mm. And what is that whole new energy? It's a new level of love and gratitude. It's a deepening into the things that we love. But in order to get there, we have to let them go to remember why we love them so much. Right? Whoa. What is for us, like, will never leave us. It, it always ends up coming back to us. I'm thinking of this Bible verse right now. It's on the tip of my tongue. It's like, God, you know, God will never leave or forsake you, mm-hmm. right? And your, cre- your creation, the things that you, like, you are God. You will never leave or forsake you. 100%. So it's- you will always come back to you. But can you trust the letting go? in order to come back to yourself more whole. Mm-hmm. So yeah. let so yeah, give breath work a break. If you're not feeling it right now, give it a break. Maybe there's No, some- that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, I have been. Uh with you, uh is breath work something that you incorporate into your daily practice or what does that look like for you your relationship to breath work? Not necessarily being a practitioner and facilitating, but your own practice. Your breath is the most important thing you have for your own evolution and is happening automatically and also intentionally. So the way that I see the breath is that I am never not using breath work because I am always using my own breath. With that said, how do I use it more intentionally? My yoga practice, right? Like I've been a yoga instructor and student for 20 years since I was 18 years old. So that is the one longstanding thing uh, intimate connection I feel like I have with my body and movement and breath. Breath works great. You're never separate from your breath. Every single person who is alive and breathing is practicing breath work, whether it's intentionally or unintentionally. And I would recommend doing it more intentionally. Like, so think of breath work like this. You're using your respiration system, right? You are respiring through your respiration system with every breath you take. What is to respire? It is to respirit. Every single breath gets you con- closer, gets you connected with your own spirit. And the more intentionally you do that, however you do that, whether it's somatic release, whether it's through sound, whether it's through yoga, whether anything is the opportunity to get you more connected with your own spirit. Yeah, 100%. I know for me, one of the things that I teach with breath work is like there's breath work exercises and breath work journeys to delineate the difference. Um, But I hear what you're saying as well, like consciously, intentionally breathing or not. Um, One of the things that's been helping a lot of people that I've recommended recently is just focus on your breath when someone else is talking. And I find for me, it's a little bit harder on a podcast, right? Because uh, we're steering and guiding in conversation. But typically, like if I find myself, oh, what am I going to say next? And I'm in my head and I'm no longer being present. That's where I'm like, all right, big inhale up through the nose, sipping a little bit more through the nose. I'm going to exhale so they can't even tell I'm doing it. You know, just incognito cyclic size, essentially. Really find it really helpful. So let's talk about the parasitic mind and the actual cleanse. So you started with a four day water fast and that's when you got out of the toxic relationship, you were let go of your job. And then from there you went into a seven day cleanse. Is that right? Uh, no, not necessarily. I did a four day water fast. I went for a month. I changed my diet immediately coming out of the water fast into a high fruit alkaline based raw food diet. So vegan, so no meat, no eggs, no nothing from an animal because animals have 
a lot of energy and a lot of consciousness. I'm not saying I'm vegan now, but I'm saying it's always good to switch up your diet, take breaks and see what works for you. Um, so vegan, high fruit, alkaline based raw food diet is how I changed my diet. So from the four day water fast, I changed my diet and I went into um, a heavy metal toxin cleanse for a month. This tincture that I was taking actually lasted three months, but I did a month of the tincture before I went into the liver, kidney, gallbladder, intestinal tract cleanse. That was a seven day fast, another seven day fast. Okay, let's let's pause here. So the the month long one, and you had this tincture at that time. You were still eating, though, right? Obviously, you're eating vegan and fruit. Is that it? I was eating fruit until five p.m. and then a raw a raw meal um, before bed. And then the tincture. How often is that? Uh, you can wean yourself on and off of it. I was taking twenty drops till I was taking thirty till I was taking forty, and these are called zeolites. Do you know what, what it is? It pulls heavy metals and toxins out of the systems. The zeolites function to do that. And I would have, you know, these crazy, you know, I love dream interpretation. I love the dream space. It's one of my favorite activities of the day is going to sleep to see what my psyche can offer me at night. Mm -hmm. um, I would have dreams while I was uh, working this tincture that all my tattoos on my arms disappeared. How is mm -hmm. that relevant to the tincture? Well, I've had seven rounds of removal on one of my tattoos. And the way that tattoo removal works is it's a laser that breaks the ink down on the inside of the body and it processes through the liver. And what is ink? Mm -hmm. Heavy metals, toxins, it's ink. And so the fact that my tattoo was disappearing in my dream space told me the zeolites are absolutely removing stuff from my body. That was just one of the many. I mean, the dream space through the entire three months was absolutely insane. Um, but that was one of the many that I had. Now, are you a foodie? Yes. <laughs> okay, awesome. <laughs> so you said yes. So what were the urges like and how did you work through that? I didn't have cravings until the parasite cleanse, which was interesting. That is interesting. You yeah. uh, cuz you you obviously normally eat meat and like good meals and uh, vegan is incredible. It's one thing about vegan food is like I get excited about uh, eating vegan food because normally that that food is always like really good and you it's like who cares that there's no meat in it? You don't even notice because it's typically pretty damn good. Yeah. Yeah, there's other ways to get protein. Um I I didn't feel lacking in any way. And I mean, you know this about me. I had a very strict uh, period of life when I was doing bodybuilding. And so I had a meal prepping company at one point in my life. So eating very clean and structured and weighing my meals. I mean, bodybuilding, you have like four schedules, your supplement schedule, your food schedule, your workout schedule, your water schedule, right? So for me to implement um, this raw food vegan diet, well, I've already created habits around very strict eating. So it wasn't it wasn't necessarily hard for me to fall suit into. Mm -hmm. okay. um, but the next one was? The parasites were a little bit more difficult. So there's a couple of things to touch on there. Before I started my cleanse, I was craving everything. Hamburgers, cheeseburgers, dairy, um, gluten, you know, bread, sugars, just like insatiable. And when I went on the four-day water fast, I wasn't hungry at all. So what does that tell me? It tells me that something else was feeding my hunger. Something else besides my own innate ability to trigger hunger was feeding me being hungry. And so when I started the parasite cleanse, first of all, I'd already done the water fast, the heavy metal toxins. I changed my diet. I cleaned my intestinal tract, liver, liver, kidneys, gallbladder, you know, like I'd already done all of that. And then I did the parasite cleanse which lasts a month. It's two weeks on, a little break, and then two weeks off according to the moon cycle. Mm -hmm. But when I started the parasite cleanse, all of the cravings came back in. So what mm -hmm. does that tell you? They're dying off within, within inside me. What do you think they want to die? No, they're like, please feed me a cheeseburger. Feed me what I need to live. 
And so the parasite cleanse was actually the hardest part, even after all of that. So when you got those urges for a cheeseburger or whatever it was, what did you do to realign your mental and, and somatic state really, you know? I would just, yeah, I would just stick to my, I would just stick to my diet. Yeah. Cause you have the, the discipline from bodybuilding yeah, and everything. Even with else. the discipline, it, it, it's not that it's not frustrating. You know, I would go outside, go on the land. I would probably try to distract myself with something, but like, it was not easy. For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for yeah. sure. Uh, so with the um, parasite cleanse, what exactly is in that? Is it a combination of different things? Yeah, enzymes. Enzymes. A combination of different things, yeah. And through this one specific, uh, specifically, you're working with our, our homie Megan or all of them? Yeah, Megan Perkins. She's amazing. Super hippie plant mama. Yes. Yeah. Love and her. Does she work with you, uh, work with people, I should say, not necessarily your situation, but or, um, in a group setting or one-on-one -on -one typically? Uh, I worked with her one-on-one. -on -one. Anybody can go with her for an iridology exam. From the iridology exam, it your eyes have, your, the pigmentation of your eyes have timestamps from the moment that you were born. And so everything that is happening on the inside, similar to Ayurvedic philosophy, where in Ayurvedic philosophy, they'll look at, at your, the whites in your eyes or what's on your tongue or what's happening in your nails for your current um, state of health, right? But the iridology exam looks at time stamps in your organs from the moment of birth. Hmm. And so I wish I, could, I wish I could show the viewers my iridology exam just to see how many time stamps were on there. So then according to what, she derives from the eyes. I was written my own personalized protocol. So whoever's listening to this podcast, don't go and copy the protocol that I did because that was cultivated specifically for me. Will the will, will there be similar things in somebody else's? Sure. But you know, I recommend having that that done for a personalized experience. I'm not sure if Megan does group work. I know she does wonderful one-on-one -on -one work. And I will tell you. Anytime I'd text her and be like, sister, the cravings are, are insane right now. You know, the only thing she would tell me, hmm. you're doing such a good job. <laughs> and do you know how that felt in my body? Uh, maybe like you weren't being seen, perhaps. No, it felt like, you're right. I can proceed with that. But See, I love how you just said yeah, you exactly. weren't being seen. And yeah. I was like, no, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go back to Buddha. Enlightenment is nothing but a perspective shift. Exactly. Am I a victim of this process or am I fully empowered in this process is a choice. Mm -hmm. no, kind of goes back yeah. to what we were saying, right? No, I noticed that as soon as I said that. Okay. For sure. All right, cool. So the cleanse, I'm going to hit up Megan and I'm going uh, to ask her if she'd be on the pod. So you guys stay tuned. We'll do a deep dive of that, hopefully. And you can always reach out to Melanie as well if you want to learn more about that. I'll put Megan's um, uh, info in the show notes so you can check it out. I want to touch on plant medicine. What has your relationship or looked like with plant medicine over the years? And what are your current beliefs, views right now? Uh, well, I started with plant medicine, you know, pretty much. Um, sat with ayahuasca a couple dozen times. Wachuma. A couple peyote. dozen? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, been, it's been quite the journey. I love her so much. I have a very intimate connection with her, even so much as I'm supposed to be sitting with her this weekend, and I've been toying with it over the last month. And in conversation with her, her is in the spirit of the plant. Do I need to sit again? You know, I, at first I was like, all the messages that you've ever given me over the last five years have been achieved and are done. And I went on the mountaintop to kind of sit with that. And she came on so strongly in this, mes in this moment of utter presence where she was like, oh, sweetie, <laughs> that's cute. You think mm -hmm. the messages are done. They're still infinitely unfolding. If you want to come drink with me, you can. But just to know, I've barely started scratching the surface of all of those messages in your life. They're not done yet. Everything's still infinitely unfolding. And so anyways, I love plant medicine. Uh, and also, 
I can't stress that after doing this full body detox, I may have just started there instead of years and years and years and sittings on sittings on sittings and excavating my psyche through plant medicine. So that would be my question then. Uh, why would you go this weekend or at all if you're saying the cleanse was the thing? Or are you just saying a starting point? Yeah, so I'm not going this weekend. The decision was made okay. that the messages are still infinitely unfolding and other things in life just didn't work out for uh, me to be there this weekend. So I'm okay with that. I trust it. Trust being like, the biggest takeaway over the last year with the dissolution to the full body detox to clearing abandonment out of my system. This word trust has been everything for me. Um, so I'm not going back and I'm totally fine with it as of right now anyways. Will I ever? I mean, probably. I love it. But I'm saying that maybe, just maybe, there is an opportunity to start right here in this tangible body before shooting off to the ethers with ineffable experiences that can be quite difficult to integrate, blowing your psyche out of the water. Is that beneficial too? Sure, there's no wrong way. But after experiencing the tangibility of this material cleanse of my own body and seeing my consciousness transform through the sobriety of that. Maybe there's an opportunity just to start there. And if you want to do plant medicine, go, go for it. Go for it. Have fun. I would suggest having an integration guide. Right? Like they say, the ceremony doesn't start until the ceremony ends. And so everything that you see in a plant medicine ceremony is a lifelong integration process. Are you ready for that? Like are Lots. like anybody that's listening, are you truly committed to the lifelong integration process that comes from plant medicine? Because you know you can be committed to your own transformation process without drinking a substance. Right. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, I just want to see where you're at with it. Thank you for sharing. We're we're getting close on time, so I want to ask you a little bit about your river rafting trip. This is what your third time. Absent. Yeah, third year in a row. Yes, third year in a row. This is another. This is another opportunity where it's like these sober moments. These these moments of sobriety. Right. Like with the land, with the own cleansing of your body, with the river, with the mountains, with the moon, with just with your own sober consciousness that takes place. So that are so powerful. I think we always need to drink another substance or take another hit of DMT or burn a hole in our body and vomit out some combo in order to transform. And it's like, get your ass out on the river. There is an infinite amount of wisdom messages abundance shifts in consciousness that just live with the land so anyways off on my soapbox again the yeah. river is uh 44 miles four days and three nights transversing between utah and colorado on the green river in dinosaur valley monument ancient ancient land right and um like i said i've sat with ayahuasca a couple dozen times. I've been to the river three times in the last three years. And I will always go back to the river. I don't know if I'll always go back to ayahuasca. We'll see, maybe she's done. But I have not been on this river like with, with a single soul that wasn't completely transformed at once leaving it. Amazing. So... End of uh, July. It was July 29th through August 2nd. Okay. www.rivers-wild.com. You can find it on my website, www.melaniejoyspeaks.com, themelaniejoyspeaks.com. Um, you can hit me up. We're going. We have tons of musicians coming. It's going to be so fun. The first year it was co-ed. The second year it was women only. And this year it's co-ed again. And we're going to have didgeridoos and handpans and 
sound bowls that I don't know if we're going to bring the gong, but guitars, maybe a Quora, rattles. I mean, drum circles, cacao, breath work, yoga. The list is endless walks to grottos and waterfalls and aquaphors for cold, cold freshwater plunges. I mean, it's so freaking fun, Sam. I hope you join us this year. Yeah, that sounds incredible. Uh, that's uh, July 29th to August 1st, you said? Oh, no, I said that wrong. August 29th through September 2nd. It's Labor Day weekend. Okay, yeah, I thought it was end of August. Uh, yeah, you're I'm right. supposed to go to Tahoe end of July, early August for River Rafting. I was just talking to a homie about it this morning. But either way, yeah, I definitely will look into that. And if I can make it, I would love to be there. If you guys listening are hearing any of this at all and you want to connect with Melanie further, all of her links are in the show notes and everything about the river rafting. You can find it in the show notes as well. The website is beautiful. There's so much information that you can check out there. And just knowing you, Melanie, for the past, I guess it's been four and a half years or something. I know you put on an extremely great event and lead from your heart. So I appreciate you showing up how you do because i mean both you and i feel like we're authentic vulnerable and there's a lot of people in the spiritual circles that do the work and they jump from ceremony to ceremony or maybe no ceremonies at all whatever they're doing the work but they just put on the mask and they don't actually do the work themselves so i just want to honor you really leaning into these edges and i appreciate you so much thank you for coming on the pod for a third time yeah thanks sam <laughs>